Fox Spurs, welcome back. Talking Tottenham every week, no better place to be sat. If it's a win, lose, draw, we'll be here for a chat. Best believe we tackle topics like Romero in the back. Young Min Son, what can go wrong when he's on form? It's a dream come true, so sit back, relax and vibe with us. Special guest. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly Sots Spurs Live. It's been a little while uh, considering all the fixtures have been night games at the moment on a Monday, um, but it's good to be back sitting at the top of the table still and unbeaten. And with me night to dissect that game against Palace, I am joined by three fabulous guests. So first of all, I'm joined by Brian. Brian, how are you, my friend? I am very, I, I think I say it every time, that intro is absolutely <laughs> banging. I love that intro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back on your channel, Holly. Thank you for having me. I hope you're well. No, I'm good. Thank you for having me. And like I say, big shout out to Forms. Uh, he was the, the geezer that wrapped it. Uh, so credit to him. Um, go check him out if you haven't, uh, so you can listen to more of his bops. Uh, but it's br- great to have you, Brian. Uh, I'm also joined by Harry. Harry, how are you this evening? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. It's great to be here. I mean, it's been, it's been a while and it's great because obviously we both have the same show on a Monday. Mine's an hour later. Um, and last season was pretty much therapy session. So it's nice. Top of the league. Actually so decent to talk about. And Brian is spot on. Fantastic intro. Uh, I love it. it. It's fantastic. Especially where we're winning at the moment. It's great to, like you say, have a right. therapy session. I listen to the pop. It's great. Uh, it's exactly. great to have you, Harry. Uh, also joined by Luke. Luke, how are you, my friend? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. I feel like all my, like, positivity, my, like, positive affirmations are, like, suddenly coming true for Spurs. So it's nice to, uh, you know, to celebrate that. No, 100%. Like I say, you were definitely the most positive person last season. I think this That's last season, I was losing my head. Uh, so it's nice to have you on, Luke, now when we're not having such negative football to discuss. Because um, that was right uh, on Friday. We did manage to obviously beat Palace 2-1. I'm going to go straight in with it. Luke, I'm going to start with you first. Um, obviously, there was a slight change in the lineup uh, because we've seen that Adogi is, is potentially injured. Um, and that meant that we had to see Davies come in. So what was your kind of um, allusions to seeing Davies uh, start in in the lineup, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those like kind of confusing ones, right? Because if we look back at the game before against Fulham, Ben Davis wasn't even in the squad, so you know, whether that was down to injury or you know, after international break or whatever it was. But then the next following week, he comes straight in and plays left fullback as an inverted fullback, when at the best of times, he's probably best as a left back, left back basically, <laughs> anywhere but on the pitch. Um, but, you know, he, he had a difficult time. It's really difficult, right, to only play bit part in the in the squad this season and then suddenly come in and have to play that role that the doggies come in and, and absolutely transformed um, when he's been in. Personally, I'd have preferred Emerson Royale in that spot. I think that he slotted in nicely when he came on in previous games as well and has done that, um, especially late on against Fulham. Uh, he came on and did that role. So I was surprised, but, you know, we all saw what happened. He got dropped at half-time and... And he was replaced by Emerson Royale. So you've got to give it to Ange for trying it, but I don't think it works. No, and I think that's the thing. I think, like you said, it's it was a worth a try, but then I'm glad that uh, possibly realised it wasn't the best kind of thing to start. Um, I would say a big thank you uh, to Alan. Uh, I didn't realise you could do raids on YouTube. So thank you very much, Alan. Welcome everybody that's joined from Alan's show. Hope you had a good time. Um, but Harry, let's let's obviously stick with Davies. Obviously, I'll start with the negative because yeah. let's get them out of the way first. Um, yes. And Luke is right at halftime. Obviously, he did come off. Um, but yeah. He, it just is defending just isn't there, really, is it? It's kind of like the old guard, if that makes sense. Um, he's yeah. the old team. He looked like the old one out to me. He didn't quite you know, fit the system. We've had a lot of fans talk about whether Hoiberg can suit the system. Uh, is he the you know, odd one out? I think, for example, Hoiberg done an excellent job against Fulham. But on Davis, you know, he, he did see like the odd one out. You know, he, he'd go up early for, for the header and he wouldn't win the ball. He, he just didn't seem right in it. It almost limited us. And we... You know, again, exposed a lot down that side. Not being funny, if he's up against Jordan Ayew, he could have been up against Eze, he could have been up against Zaha last season, at least, say. So if he couldn't handle Ayew, I'd be very worried if we face the likes of Manchester City uh, and Adoki's out, you know. So, yeah, fair play to Andrew Trotlin, as you both allude to, uh, and, and good on him for recognising it. I mean, we discussed it yesterday. Uh, I think we can all agree that it's worth trying, but it didn't work. He recognised that. Whereas we've had previous managers in the last few years, the likes of Conte, who would have looked at that and, and known that it, you know, it, it hadn't worked, his trial hadn't worked, he got it wrong, and, and wouldn't have accepted that and would have kept him on till the end because it doesn't look good for the manager. So it's nice to have someone who can trial things and recognise mistakes as that flexibility. But yeah, no, Davis, it didn't quite suit him. So, you know, if, if we're in this situation again, Adoki's injured or it's longer than we think, then 
it probably has to be Emerson in that position. No, definitely, 100%. I think that's the thing. I think we've all realised that even though Adoji's only really come into this side, Ryan, he is such a yep. miss when he's not there. Holly, big time. That's that's the. I, I, I usually say you can tell how important a player is when he's out of the team. And you saw that very, very clearly on Friday night. I don't, you know what it is? Ben De Destiny is doing so well and offers so much that you were always going to see the difference. You were always going to see the difference. And unfortunately, that gap is just so far. I think Destiny at the moment has been the best left back in the league, bar none. He offers so much forward and back. And obviously, Ben Davis just can't do that. He never could do it to the extent of um, of destiny so so when he came in and normally now you've seen both the tottenham and wales he's been mainly using the left center back of a back three he was back in a position where it just doesn't suit him it looked better a lot better unfortunately or fortunately when emerson came on um ben davies just can't the, if we're still playing conte football jose football he would have had a much better performance, a much better performance. But we're asking him to do stuff that he just can't do right now. It's it's just you can't. And the bridge, sir, sir he was always going to stand out. And he did really look like uh, he couldn't keep up with the pace of the game, didn't he? Yeah, no. And I think that's what we've all kind of said in a sense as well, that Ange saw that and he saw it very early on. And I'm glad that he did make that change. Like I say, I think Emerson had a bigger impact uh, down that side. Um, but talking about defence, Luke, um, my favourite person, Mickey van der Ven, a.k.a. Daddy Longlegs, once again showing his worth uh, at the back alongside Romero. What what do you make of him, um, especially in this game and in the season so far? Yeah, I think, do you know what? At the start of the season, first game, I mentioned this last night and um, I felt like obviously he'd only been there three days right before he came into the game against Brentford. So, you know, you can't talk a lot about it, but there was a few touches of him on the ball in the first game that I thought, is he going to work? Is he not? And I know it's so early to start judging someone about that, but I think you've always got to have thoughts like that in your brain. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the amount that that kid has grown into this team and grown into his defending and growing into the Premier League is absolutely outstanding. Like, if James Madison wasn't so unbelievable for Spurs, he would be my signing in the Premier League season by far because his pace is absolutely disgusting of how fast he was. And that was part of uh, part of Ben Davis's problem was that Van der Ven was having to come and mop up everything that he couldn't keep up with, even in the uh, left-back role. But you know, I know that Will Hughes is like the slowest man alive, but <laughs> even to see like the turn of pace and be able to come back and um, and and get the ball back, you know, some of the last ditch tackles in the last ten minutes of the game, I felt like he didn't put a, a foot wrong. You know, there's been times this season he scored no goal, hasn't he? And you know, different things like that earlier on in the season, but all of that's getting wiped out, and him and Romero next to each other are just a class act. Mm, they really are. They are a duo that we've needed for a very long time. And obviously, alluded on to Romero, um, Harry, it's mad to think. I think there was a, a stat yesterday that said he made the most passes uh, for, for Tottenham in the Premier League. I mean, that's just a madness, isn't it? Holly, I, I can give you that stat. I can get you. So he made 141 successful passes. But to put this into perspective, he made 141 passes himself. Crystal Palace's entire yeah. first 11 only made 137. It's mad. But about 50 of them were back to, um, to Vicario. A path <laughs> is a path. A path <laughs> is a path. Yeah. Oh, so, after you, thank you for that stat, Brian. I actually didn't know. I, I, I knew that he had more passes than Palace. I didn't know his exact number, so that's actually quite helpful. Um, but yeah, Romero, I mean, it was kind of, we discussed it, didn't we, Luke, yesterday. It's, it was almost like, like mocking it. It wasn't disrespectful, but it, it just kind of shows the confidence they have on the ball, just how quickly and just implements his style of football uh, on these players. And fair play to them for buying into it. And, you know, so quickly, we've seen, like, uh, Man, Man United, for example, and now under Eric Ten Hag, Chelsea, Pochettino, Arsenal, Arteta, how long it takes or is going to take them to really invest into, you know, the manager's ideas to really be put into... On the football pitch, I don't like to use them as an example. We have got them this week. Chelsea under Pochettino against Arsenal showed glimpses of the team that he wants them to be in terms of go 2-0 up, out of control, but they couldn't take their chances and there's a lot of mistakes uh, in that team. But it's just how quickly we've done it. 
you know, from game one. So that's that's really impressed me considering the preseason, um, you know, the difficult preseason. It's fair to say that we had as well. Um, so you know, he's really impressed me. Formed an elite partnership with media for some years with Van der Ven. It feels like Toby and Jan all over again. That confidence on the ball, defensive unit. You know, who this said it? We look comfortable defensively, and I'm not worried about going up against anyone. That that's something you asked me three months ago. I'd laugh at you if you thought I'd say that because we were awful defensively. So it's, it's nice to have a safe pair of hands uh, in defence. And, and as for Van der Ven as well, also excellent. Mm, no, definitely. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Harry. I think you're right in a sense that we've waited so long to have a partnership and we finally have that one within exactly. us. Um, but Brian, I want to come to you because it was very strange from Palace. I know we've mentioned, um, both the boys have said about how um, it's almost like we were toying with Palace at times, but their press was just non-existent, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, I just want to say with Luke's comment, for me, Van der Ven still is signing of the season. And the only reason I say that is because we play so high because of his pace, it's allowing Madison to do what he does. And I think we needed a, a Vertonghen replacement more than we needed an Ericsson replacement. But they're, but, I mean, what a conversation to have. Which one's the signing of the season? It's incredible. But uh, yeah, listen, do you know what? Crystal Palace to start with, that. Whatever they set out to do in the first half, it was working. Whether it was we only had three days to recover and it's the first time we've had to do that in the Premier League, whether it was because we did not have Ben Davis. I mean, when Van der Ven went down holding his knee, I was screaming expletives about how weak our, 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 the strength in depth was. And thank God he got up. But everything, you, you've just got to look at that first half, they could put us under a serious amount of pressure and probably stifled us. Um, but you just have to look at that second goal and not just the, the build-up for the second goal as in Johnson and Madison. Look at the build-up from the back with Vicario and all of them and how they worked it to find the ball to start, to start that move off. Every single aspect beforehand with, with Conte, Jose, there was no you had no idea what the game plan was. Apart from get the ball to Kane. That was it. Why are we going backwards sideways? Why are we doing it at the back when we've got players that can't play it out from the back? Why are we allowing Lloris to do what he does? Because he puts... Up... There was no method behind the madness. Yeah. Whereas now, when you see Spurs playing the ball behind, like between the back five, you're like, right, there's a reason. You can sit... And one thing we, 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 we have to learn, like Andrew always says, is patience. Mm. People are going to come and rather than forcing it and changing the way we play and just keep doing it, just keep doing it, the moment will come. And that's what we've been doing. And the thing is, we as fans know it's coming. We've got the belief that that chance is going to come and we're going to take it. But yeah, Crystal Palace, I actually think in that first half, got their game plan absolutely spot on the money. Yeah. They just couldn't keep up with it for, the, for, for 90 Mm. Like, I think you're right. Yeah, like you said, I think we were toying around with it, weren't we, in the second half? So you're, yeah. you're right to say in the first half, um, they seem to be honest. But it was the fact that Mickey van der Ven could just keep running. And, and it felt like whenever they got the ball on a 1v1 situation, I was like, oh, it's fine. Mickey van der Ven's there. He'll, he'll clear him out. Um, and, and he did. But like you say, I was very worried uh, when he went down holding his knee. Okay. Um, but I want to talk about, obviously, another man, uh, and that is Richarlison. Um now, I'm going to come to you, Luke, because obviously there's a lot of talk about Richardson. And I I think against Palace, he had some very good moments and some not very good moments. Uh, so what was your kind of take on, on Richardson out on that side? Well, I made a statement last night and I'll say it again. Richardson has the worst touch of any Brazilian footballer in the history of Brazilian football. Because honestly, I don't understand how, you know, a player from a nation which is renowned for you know, their first touch, their ability on the ball is so poor oh, so often on the ball. Look, I think that there is something wrong with Richarlison, a confidence issue. I think he, you know, gets very within himself when you see him play and he gets very frustrated at himself. And I think that doesn't help him. But I don't know how many chances I can give him. I think he will start at the weekend. I think he'll start against Chelsea. But I think that'll be it. I think you'll see Brennan Johnson come on earlier. And I think if he performs like he did against Crystal Palace and like he did when he came on at Sheffield United um, earlier in the season, I think we will start to see Richarlison being uh, kind of ousted out of the first team because he started the season playing as a, as a striker, right, through the middle. He wasn't very good at that. 
So Andrew's moved him out to the left to try and utilise him a little bit more. Because when Son was on the left, Son's ability and Son's shot shooting ability and kind of in front of goal was stifled because of how wide Ange likes his wingers to play. So actually Son's assets were then taken away because all he had was his really his pace to him, right? So he stuck with Charleston out there, who you don't need to see too much more of. His, his the idea of him is to then stretch the you know the back four of the opposition out wide to then create spaces for Madison, for Saar, for Son, you know, or for Sumo, who whoever comes in. Um, or the, you know, the inverted fullbacks. So he's moved him out there to try and utilise him a little bit more. But I think it will get to a point where, you know, if Brennan Johnson can step up and really cement his place, we will start to see Richardson um, leaving. Look, I, I do like him. I think he's I think he's all right. I do have a little soft spot for him. You know what I'm like? I like all these people. I used to like Davison Sanchez, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know why. There's just certain players that, like, I think it would be really nice if it worked out for you. But then at the same time, you've got to say, you know, what's done is done. Mm, no, I think this is the tricky thing. I think playing Richarlison out there is, is definitely better for Spurs and for him. I think his one-two passing, um, especially to Madison, that wing, is something that I think is a genuinely good thing. But for you, Harry, sort of like Luke said, I think when Johnson obviously gets a bit more match fitness within him because he's trying to get over that little injury that he's had, I think yeah. he's going to be the number one over Richarlison. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't think Richardson has been as bad as some people make out. I'd love to sit here and go, look, he's been excellent. You know, he, he scored 50 goals. He's having a huge contribution to the team because that just, you know, we all know that isn't true. However, every game I watch him, I do see signs of improvement. But Luca alludes to like his first touch, which is very true. You see good bits from Richardson against Palace. Neat passes, a little flick that comes off. Then a really, really poor first touch under no pressure. Um, I do think it's a confidence thing, but at the same time, I do think he's improving. And I, I'm going to use this as a stat again. I used it yesterday. Uh, and although the bar is very low, he has passed his goals and assists tally. And if, I know I know it's very low, but we are only 25% of the way through the season. We're playing under a new system for me. He looks good uh, in that position, uh, left wing, if you like, where Son did play. Because uh, Son's obviously been moved inside. He's more effective there. That was very clever from Ange. Uh, but at the same time, Brennan Johnson came off the bench. Huge contribution to the goal. You know, really, really effective. That's a second, excellent second goal, by the way, which I'm sure we'll get on to. But Johnson's a key part of that, um, which which I love. But yeah, Johnson, for me, maybe just about edges against Chelsea, but it could be Richardson's type of game in terms of you need that little bit of passion, that little bit of hunger, you know, that, that extra 10% in your performance. So yeah, I'm, I'm still behind him. I think he still needs time. Obviously, we come to the end of the season, he's, he's not scoring. Then, of course, it's an issue. But in, in my opinion, now he's contributing to the team. But there's, of course room for improvement. No, it's a good point because like you said, he has managed to pick up some assists already this season. And yeah. Brian, I think that's the thing. I think because we want to see more from Richarlison, um, some people are a bit more heavily on how bad he's sometimes doing, but I don't think it's necessarily awful. It's just you want a bit more from him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, uh, we've all what Luke said about his first touch. I, I, I'm convinced he wears bouncy castles for football boots. <laughs> Because his first touch is, is is so poor. But you know what the frustrating thing with him? I thought he was fantastic first half against Liverpool. Yeah. I thought he was really good first half against Fulham. Yeah. I think he had moments in the first half against Crystal Palace. It's just a shame these, these games, it seems to be the first 45 minutes he can do stuff. And in the second 45, he just becomes worse. He can't seem to get 90 minutes or a good 60 minute performance under his belt it's always an okay first 45 and the way we're playing football now and the way we need to goals to be contributed or assists because we can't all rely on sun it's been found out a lot more easier and then you look at brennan johnson who came on against sheffield united yes that was the game of charles and got the but brennan johnson had an assist but the goal was ruled out for a foul a goal but it was ruled out for offside and his pace scared the life out of Sheffield United. Played against Arsenal, could have had a couple of goals, picked up the injury, comes on against Palace and had a major contribution. And not just as he having a major contribution, that game against Crystal Palace, the one thing that I tweeted at halftime we were lacking was blinding pace with Destiny out. And Brennan Johnson gives you that in abundance. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah. the attribute like if Richard, I, I think Richarlison may start against Chelsea as well and try and wear them down and then he'll come on. But he's having the impact and he has attributes that Richarlison just hasn't got. And in an Ange Postacoglu team, you're going to need pace and you're going to need to contribute. And he's doing that. And Richarlison, I really wanted him to do well. I think the injury to Perisic yeah. has been an absolute shocking for him because that is one guy that could genuinely get balls into him and use his aerial strength. But that ain't going to happen anymore because we all think he'll be off in January or he won't be fit. But he's running out of time. We're at a time right now where there are options. We've struggled for a long time with people on the bench going, well, who can come on and make a difference? Well, now there's him, there's Brian Hill. There are people that are much better suited to our system than Richarlison. And if he doesn't get a good game in against Chelsea, like Luke said, I think that's it. You're on the bench and you mm -hmm. won't get back in. I think so. And I think that's the thing. It's, it's a nice position to be in, to think that there are these these big impact players now on the bench. But like you say, it feels bad to say, I think Richarlison's maybe come at, I don't want to say the wrong time, but he hasn't managed to step his game up when he needs to. I mean, there is a little bit more time, but like we've all kind of said, the, the time is running out. Um, but obviously, we got to half time, um, and then, no surprise, Luke, uh, the man to make things happen once again is that Magic Matters, because uh, he obviously did manage to get, I'm going to say he got the goal, but obviously it was an own goal award. But again, I mean, there's so much high praise for Madison at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. And and sometimes you just need, you know, it's such a cliche and I feel sick saying it, right? But sometimes you need to put the ball in the box and see what happens, right? <laughs> sometimes you just got to, as he does, as he did, just hit it across the, you know, the six-yard box. Look at the goal that, that won it against Liverpool. That was all it needed was the perfect cross across the box. And, you know, and defenders panic. And, and that's exactly what happened. Um, James Madison is is outstanding. And, you know, I wasn't sure on him when he was coming to Spurs. I really wasn't. I wasn't sure, you know, whether he would um, be the right kind of player to join Spurs, whether, you know, he has lots of things like fashion things outside of football and whether kind of his head was fully in into football. And, you know, I've been, been massively, massively proven wrong because, you know, he's been absolutely outstanding, outstanding for us. And it, this game really needed a goal like that because especially with Palace's really low block, the way that we play, the intricate passing around the box, we weren't, you know, taking that many shots. And so it really needs something like that to open the game up a little bit. And uh, yeah, as I said, sometimes you just got to put the ball in the box and see what happens. And <laughs> Definitely. And I think there's been far too many times so uh, in so many matches where we try and walk the ball into the back of the net. And it is like, just have a shot. Um, and it was great that obviously we got off the mark with that. Um, but Harry, I'll come to you because obviously there was another player that I forgot to mention in the lineup, and that was that Basuma got put straight into the team. Now, what was your yeah. kind of mate when you saw his name on the team sheet and what did you make of his performance? Um, firstly, I was very surprised to see him because obviously he was on for you know, the cards. Chelsea, we all know how, how big that is every single year, regardless of you know how well Chelsea perform at the moment. They'll be up for it. it's a big game, it's a London derby. Um, so I was surprised really. I thought Hoybeck done a good enough job against Fulham to be able to to you know not not have to worry about him starting against Palace, for example. But fair play to Anchi, the manager, very worried before the game when I saw the team news. But you know he delivered on the performance. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, we got told him yesterday by Callum that Basuma didn't play well. I don't know where that came from for me. He, he was excellent. I called it a dire statement. I think it is dire because I thought uh, Basuma was really good. At times, maybe he kept holding the ball too long, but he's just great. He ball carries, keeps the ball well, and it makes his midfield really tick and, and you know, very key part. I love that Ben back got back on the pitch, uh, but where does he fit into this midfield? Saar gets better every game. Basuma, very, very key part, and you can't take Jace Madison out. So it's a good problem, I suppose, for Ange to have, especially with the thought of Europe next season. But no, Basuma was great, but surprised, a bit worried before the game, to be fair. <laughs> no, I, I think we all were, to be fair, because like you said, yeah. I thought Hoiberg played quite well uh, in the game before. And I mean, for you, Brian, what is your kind of make on Hoiberg? Because I think for me, I was a bit like... I don't really think there's a place for him anymore, but he seems to be doing a job when we need him to do one. So, so for the first two years we had him, he was my favourite player by far. I thought he's brilliant. Do you know what? The, what you've got to remember with Pierre is whether you love him or you hate him, if we were to ask every Spurs fan around the world, name one player that you think will be fit to play this game, this game, this game, this game, this game, 
everyone will say Pierre Emil Hoybier because he he just don't get injured. He's dependable. Last season he started to really annoy me. This season, this guy is not getting enough respect. Thank you. We all know what didn't happen in the summer. We all know that he changed his agent because of it. Um, and he, and you can't blame him. He wants first team football. His country are going to be at the Euros. He's going to want first team, but I think he gets picked no matter what for Denmark. Um, he's been, he was a first teamer, part of the leadership committee, and he's gone down to you're a sub that will play if someone's suspended and you're nothing to do with the leadership committee. And he was immense against Fulham. He's come on. Yeah. When he's come on, he's been asked to do the job, hold the hold the midfield. Don't. That's what he's been asked to do. See the game out. People are saying he doesn't pass the ball forward enough. He was spraying 50-yard pings against Fulham. He came yeah. on in that second half, and our attack went from being reserved like it was in the first half, or caged in by Palace, to being more dynamic. Basuma, I think, had to, was just played the way he did. I still like Harry. I think he had a good game. And the, my biggest thing to take from his performance was he knew he had to be disciplined not to pick up a yellow card. Yeah. And he did it. It may not have been the performance against United or Burnley or whatever where he's dominated games. Big up, Colin, my brother. I uh, love this man. Um, but Basuma had to come on and do a job and not pick up a yellow card and let the team down. He did it. Hoybier came on and said, right, Hoybier deserves a hell of a lot more respect this season than what he's getting. Whether you love him or hate him, go look at his stats. Go look at his uh, what he's doing. And you haven't heard him bitch or moan and go, I want first team football. Or why so yeah. I'm very, very, I, I'm delighted with what Hoybier has done this year. No, that's a very good point. I think last season I did call him glorified Harry Winks, though, because the amount of times he passed the ball oh, oh, backwards. Oh, and I was like, I'm not having anybody slate my Winksy if you're going to say that Hoiberg doesn't do the same. But no, I think you're right. This season, I think I think it's just because we've got a progressive manager again and everybody's flourishing, um, which is yep. nice to see. Um, and talking about people flourishing, uh, Luke, I want to talk about Saar, because again, he was kind of that that start of that, that motion for that second goal. Uh, I mean, what a man he is as well. And he's so young still. Yeah, definitely. I, I've said this a few times now and I genuinely believe it. I think that he could be one of or the best midfielders in the Premier League. Like, I genuinely believe that. I think that he has all the attributes, right? He's tall. He's strong. He's got a little bit of pace about him. He's good on the ball. Um, he can play it further back, like we saw last season, you know, when he played against um, AC Milan in the Champions League alongside Oliver, Oliver Skip. He can play further back, or like Arsenal last season. Or he can play, you know, where he roams forward, little intricate passes at the edge of the box. I honestly think he's got everything. And I know lots of people kind of made this analogy, but they're like the kind of closest you can get to him is probably like a Yaya Torre esque player. And I think he could probably get to the levels that he has also got to. Um, but I've mentioned this loads as well. Like the thing that we, we forget is like we're all astounded by how good this player is. But he came from the same scouting pool as Sadio Mane um, at Mets. And he's kind of, they know what they're looking at. They have a really good Senegalese like scouting pool, I think, at Mets. And, um, you know, we, we got him at the right time, but we also got a manager in who really, really trusts and believes in him and lets him kind of flourish in all his abilities. The problem with Antonio Conte last season is everyone was so shackled into their roles. No one was allowed, I believe, this kind of freedom um, that they've got. But, uh, you know, I just I just wonder when Bentoncourt comes back, he would, and I, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but that would be, in my eyes, the player that drops out. I believe. I don't see it being with Sumo. I don't see it being James Madison. But it would be very, very harsh on him if he did. And it's up to Rodrigo Bendicourt to prove that, you know, he can get back into this team, which is an unbelievable thought to think about, isn't it? It really is. And I think, I know Harry mentioned it earlier, but it was so great to see Bentancourt come back onto the pitch. But Harry it is, and he's going to have a bit of a headache. And I'm glad I'm not the manager. <laughs> oh, so am I. Goodness me. What, what a, you know, kind of challenge to have. I mean, it's good in the way. Um, we've got that depth because one thing you know, we, we've discussed on partly in podcasts that I brought up is, 
is squad depth. You know, if we get injuries, how are we going to cope? And, and one area I think we're all right is in that midfield. Now Benson Corey's back. But at the moment, this is, where does he get in? I wouldn't, I wouldn't take anyone out of that midfield. Like you say, you know, we saw excellent improves every game. Uh, I don't want to put that that pressure on him that he can be one of the best in the league, Europe, etc. But if you do look at any, you look at the best midfielders in, in, in the world in the last few years or right now, he has his potential to have everything they've got. And it, it just what he shows is, is fantastic. Sometimes it's frustrating, like, like with anyone, he loses the ball, but he goes and wins it back or he shows fight to win it back. I, I love that. And he's so far ahead of where he should be for his age, which is really, really impressive. People forget how young he is. So what a star. I mean, he's a star already. Uh, you know, you look at anyone out of Spurs, I think all their futures are bright, especially under Costa Coglu. But you look at Saar and you go, you know, this kid is something. I don't, again, don't want to put pressure on him, but we talk about these big price tags that players are going for at the moment. He looks like the next one that that will be massive. So there's a comment earlier saying that four clubs are interested in Pape Matis. So I read that yesterday and, and said, no, that is why... You know, Posta Coglu gets the credit that, that he deserves. He knows when he sees talent. He knows how to adapt and fit into his system. Even someone like Son, who's ready proven, he struggled last season. Uh, there, there's no getting away from that. And saw that. And, and the best way to get out of him is playing him centrally. He saw that, recognised it, and changed it. So that, I think that's excellent. But yeah, what, what a dilemma to have uh, in midfield. I'm glad to have all those options. Uh, it's a shame you can't get four midfielders in there. It's all absolutely excellent. <laughs> no, I think you're very right. I think it's true. There's there's so much talent in that middle. And then, Brian, I know you were getting excited when I mentioned Saar, so I'm going to let yep. you far away. Go for it. No, I mean, all, all, all I'll say with Saar is I've, I've been a huge fan of his for a while, especially after the Milan game. It just goes to show how stubborn and arrogant Antonio Conte was. Because if you look at it, he had aces like him and Basuma in his side and wouldn't adjust the team to play to their strengths. He kept playing skip. I, I mean, I don't know how Saar wasn't a regular after that Milan game. Um, Luke said Yaya Torre. Colin said Patrick Vieira, which are the... And then someone said on my channel the other day, they put another player in the, link, in the loop that he could be, which is N'Golo Kante. What three players to be compared to at 20 years old? Mad. People have been saying, oh, do you know what? On the ball, his passing is, needs to improve. Yeah, it might do. But do you know what? He's losing the ball because we're playing attacking football. When you're playing attacking, rather than these little Harry Winks to Oliver Skip and Oliver Skip back to... <laughs> we're, we're being adventurous. You look at it, both those goals against Palace, he is heavily, heavily, heavily involved in them. His engine... And the, we started the season and Skip played against Brentford. And obviously, he didn't do too well. Since Sarah has been in there, Bissouma and Madison, uh, this trilogy is the perfect balance. It's the perfect balance. And Pape Matasar, his work rate off the ball is second to none. And like Luke was saying with Benson Core coming back, and right now, thankfully, we've had it in the past where players are fit. The second they're like where Benson Core is, you're in the team. You're playing. You're on. Get on. We're in a position right now where we can drip feed Benson Core in until January. Come on for 10 minutes, come on for 15, come on for 20, come on for... Because you've got such quality in midfield now, such quality, we don't have to rush this guy back. Pape Matassar has been absolutely incredible this season. He's another player that isn't getting the respect. Look at that... Uh, game against Fulham. Do you remember that run he made to cut our cross with a diving header? Mm -hmm. His reading of the game is incredible. He's getting into the box. He's everywhere. He is, and he's 20 years old. 20. And when we signed him, I was one man that was going mad, going, oh, here we go. Cheap prospect. Why are we buying a midfielder now? We need we need players for now, not for a few. Paratici, once again, has played an absolute blinder he is magnificent. He is magnificent, Pape Matasar. I love that kid. Mm -hmm. No, I think I don't think I can add any more to that, Brian. I think you've hit the nail mm -hmm. on the head once again. Um, and I, I think the thing is as well, and I think he's proved a lot of people wrong in a sense that we've actually got, at the moment, touch wood, the players in that we've needed. Um, and they've actually proven, although they might have been the cheaper option, they're actually proven. It's like we've almost got 
an idea of which way we're going to go now. It's not let's pay money and hope. We're actually seem to be yep. going down the right route. And I hope that continues because obviously I think January could also be a, a massive for us to to try and push us over that that next kind of step if we can to progress through the rest of the season. Um, but Luke, it wasn't all plain sailing uh, because towards the end of the game, it, it gave me old Tottenham vibes in, uh, uh, what's it, like hairy bum time in a sense that there was going to be a call for Palace. Squeaky sadly, bum. Squeaky bum. I, was, I was thinking hairy, that's not the right word, is it? You know what I mean? You can tell it's Monday for me. Um, but Luke, how did you kind yeah, of... Yeah, remember what you're into, I suppose, but... <laughs> I, I need to sleep, I think. Um, what did you make uh, of, obviously, the last 10 minutes or the, the last 10 minutes of extra time? Uh, yeah, you know, of course there was that, you know, bit, you know, within me that kind of was, you know, feeling extremely unwell at that point, thinking, here we go again. I can read the headlines, you know, I can feel the tweets from my fans, at, you know, uh, sorry, my friends that support different clubs and I can, you know, I can feel all these messages coming in. But then there's that other part of me. It's kind of like Jekyll and Hyde in a sort of way, where I'm thinking, I know that we can, you know, that we can hold on here. I know that, you know, we have the quality within us, and I know that, you know, that we can kind of get a result here. But I'll tell you what, I didn't like was how high that line was in like the very last minute of the game when they had a free kick in their, you know, their own half, and you know, our line was just just slightly deeper the halfway line. But they pulled it off. Fair play to them. They pulled it off and it was absolutely fantastic. But I don't think I've seen this play such a high line as that before. Mm. But um, anyway, yeah, it, it was squeaky bomb time, definitely. But it's nice to have that little feeling that says, do you know what? I feel like we can still see this out. And I feel like that kind of like spursiness, you know, as people like to say, is kind of like slowly drifting away. But I think it will always be there. <laughs> Definitely squeaky, not hairy bum time. Um, but um, look, uh, Harry, um, what did you kind of make of the decision that was because it's always controversy and I still don't get the bloody handball rule? Because for me, are you should have been either yellow carded before that incident, way before because the ref was, I don't know, it was on some other planet. But what did you kind of make of, of the, the, the goal that was given? For me, it's handball. But at the same time, we sit here and you, you know you sum it up perfect, Holly. We don't know what the rule is. It's consistency we want, but we know that come this weekend, that happens again in a different game, and you know he's given us handball, and, and that's the frustrating thing. Uh, you know, so for me, I don't want to see that given. Yes, it hits his chest first, but it rolls down his arm. Uh, that's one thing, and it changes. If you look back closely and analyse it, it changes the direction that the ball takes it. I mean. You could argue Porro wasn't going to get there anyway, but it does take you know the, the ball away. And any chance Porro has of getting there because it touched his hand, goes in a different direction, makes it hard. But at the same time, I don't want to take anything away from the strike because he's you know, hit that really well. Uh, and that kind of strike does deserve a goal. But no, it should have been disallowed. It, I'm glad that it had no impact on the result. But it's you know it still could have an impact, of course, with goal difference to, to either side. Um, but you know this is not the point because it could happen in a different situation that could cost the team. Um, you know, I was watching Wolves against Newcastle the other day, and I, I think they were really unlucky as well with with, with a decision that, that went against the Manchester derby as well. We've seen. I, I don't agree with the decisions we're seeing, but it's the consistency that we want. They are not the weekend we just had, but the weekend before I thought had an excellent weekend or an excellent Saturday, but then followed up by for me a shambolic display this weekend. So it's the consistency we're after because it's different officials, it's different opinions. But for me, that goal shouldn't have stood. I can't understand. Well, I, was given. I think that's the thing. And like Janet said as well, we've, um, oh no, Kantev said we could have obviously got a fifth clean sheet as well, Brian. I think yeah. that's the most irritating thing, isn't it? Well, for me, yeah, like I said, I, I was putting a tweet out going, right, we've won three games out of three. We got nine points out of nine. We scored five goals. And I was just typing, we've gone the whole month keeping a clean sheet. <laughs> and then that strike went in. I was like, oh, you. <laughs> so, 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 listen. When it comes to the the goal, I, I I won't talk about handball rules anymore because it's it, like like Harry said, like like we said, no one has a clue. No one has an absolute clue. It's it's pointless. You have this discussion, and there'll be people in the comments. Oh yes, it was. Oh no, what? No one knows. But what I will say, going back to to what you asked about the squeaky bum time, do you know what? Yes, it was nerve wracking. But do you know what it is? What the way I took from it is, it was another test that we were given, conceding a goal right at the end. Tottenham Hotspur last season, that's a draw. Hmm. Or a loss. 
Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Luke. And yeah. then you look at it, Porro, who's been magnificent this season. Did he miss time the header, the, the flight of the ball? Yes. Could you say he's a little bit of fault for the goal? Yes. But then you see that block six or seven minutes later made that he front. made. He went rushing in, and that could have been an easy rush to the blade, a foul penalty done. He didn't let his head drop. He kept his eye on the ball, and he saved what could have been the shot that made it to all. So I've been looking at this, trying to look at it a different way. I'm like, right, people say we haven't been tested because we're playing one game a week. Well, we played two games in a week. We won both. Okay, you haven't conceded a late goal yet. How are you going to deal? Well, we did it, and we passed it. So every test people are throwing at us, we keep passing them. So yes, did I have squeaky bump time? You bet. I think every Spurs fan was like, oh, no. No, no, no. And Because also, you got to remember, there was the pressure of being five points clear mm. and the first game and setting the tone. Yeah. These players are going in every game right now going, everyone's watching you. Everyone is waiting for you to, that first defeat yeah, yeah. or that first Spurs thing to happen. And that's a lot of pressure for the players, let alone us as fans. <laughs> and again, every single time so far, and please, God, please, God, against Chelsea. We are passing the test. So, so I looked at it as another brilliant defensive performance and showed another string to our boat. Mm, that's probably the best way to put it. I never looked at it like, oh, my God, this is like the positive, positive. Mate, I when, love I'm it. Being positive, <laughs> when I'm being this positive, you've got to think, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I love it, though. It's a good position to be in. Um, and I like the fact, obviously, that you brought up Chelsea because that is who you've got next, Luke. Uh, so what's your kind of thoughts going into this game uh what, what did you take from it it's a lot different than it ever has been before you know I think it's very similar to like what we spoke about about conceding late on like I'm pretty I would say I'm pretty confident against Chelsea you know when I look at not the name Chelsea right when I look at the players that are on the pitch and you know and how um Pochettino is dealing with you know the fact that they've signed 50 million players and spent half a billion pounds or whatever it is but um you look at that squad and you I couldn't I probably couldn't name you half of their starting lineup that will start for the weekend. Because either they change it or because there's so many new players, I've absolutely no idea who half of them are. Um and but, but anyway, my point is is that going into this game, I would say I was pretty confident. The only part of me that isn't confident is that same part that was worried that we might have conceded again late on and drawn the game. It's the same part of me that knows going up against Chelsea, it's never going to be an easy game. But one of the other things to think about is that all of these players that have played at Spurs over the years and that have struggled against Chelsea and that, you know, kind of have that fear about this fixture, how many of them are actually left in this squad? How many of them are still there that, you know, are going to be going into this game with any experience over that fixture? If you look kind of around the park and you look at, okay, you might... Look at Poro, Son. Um, who else are we looking at in that? Romero. Spot? Yeah, maybe Romero. You know, you've got maybe three players there, right? The rest of that team haven't experienced that and have a fresh mind when it comes to going into that. I think that's why that also helped us going into the North London derby as well. Um, awesome. I think that you know you can look at any fixture and say, how can they, you know, worry about a fixture that they've never been a part of and. Someone's told me to spit it out, so I'll probably end it there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right, though, in a sense that, like you said, they haven't really experienced that. So they're not going to necessarily, not know, they're going to know what it means to us, but they're not going to know the, the, the toxic nature of it. Uh, I mean, Luke, the fact that Pochettino is obviously coming back to the Tottenham Stadium in itself is going to be a massive statement for us to go over and, and prove and get the job done, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that, you know, we have to respect, you know, to a certain degree, what Pochettino has done, but then we also have to look at it in the other, in the same sense, and say, you know, you said you would never go and manage Arsenal. You said you would never go and manage Barcelona. I think Chelsea falls into that same bracket, and I think once you cross that, you know, very precarious line, I think you have to look at um, any relationship and say. Yeah. It was nice knowing you. See you later. <laughs> and I think as well, um, Harry, I think as much as it's going to be a, a game for us fans in the sense that we want to get this yeah. done against Pochettino, I also think it's a good time to also bury it now and move on, isn't it, if we get this win over the line? Very. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've seen lots of people debating whether to clap or cheer him or not. And that 
baffled me. I had to to go away and, and think about it for the day, thinking, hang on, what have I just read here? People considering cheering Pochettino. Whatever you, you make of the job he's done, he has, like Luke rightly says, crossed that line. He never said he wouldn't go to Chelsea, but for me, that's in the same category as Arsenal. We're talking about a big London rival, but what I find baffling most of it, he went through the Battle of the Bridge himself. He was involved with the pushing and shoving. He was in the middle of it all. He was dishing it out. He was taking it. So I, I find that baffling that he's done that because uh, he could have said no. It, it, you know, it's him at the end of the day. I get that perhaps he was annoyed with Levy. I uh, wanted, wanted to kind of, you know, send a message to him if you like. Um, but for me, I, I don't forgive him for that. And I, I'll absolutely be booing him because I'm there myself. Well, you want to make it hostile for your London rivals. And, you know, you want to, that includes the manager. And they, they thought by all means you should be taunting, etc. Maybe after the game, Holly, we, we put it to a side. But we're facing Chelsea right now, especially if we batter them, then it, it should absolutely be rubbed in. Because, you know, I don't think his, his job's that secure because we know what Chelsea are like with sacking managers with or without Roman Abramovich. Todd Bowley's proven that with, with Potter. I think he was still quite quite brutal with that. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's, it's very, very simple. He's booed. Yes, he probably done some good things at Tottenham. Um, but at the end, it's different if perhaps he's won four Premier League titles with us. It's different. There's respect there. But I don't have respect for someone who, who's who gone to a rival uh, and, and, and knows what that will do to a fan base. So for me, I think he needs to find out what it means to us on, on Monday. I'm ready to go. I love it, man. I love it. Uh, but Brian, I want to get your final thoughts on the game. Um, obviously, we've mentioned some star players. Um, what What do you kind of think is going to go down? What Obviously, they're not in great form at the moment. They did lose uh, at the weekend. So saying that, that obviously puts us into good stead. So what are you What are yep. you going to take from the game? What do you think is going to happen going forward? So there the, are the a couple of good facts about this game. Well, first of all, Chelsea, in every game they've lost, have had a higher uh, uh, expected, expected goals than the people that they've lost to. They just can't score. They, they play well. They just cannot score. Um, and the best thing about it, just when Poch knows what's coming his way, I would have thought, listen, I'm going to have my assistant manager, my right-hand mind by my side to, to, take, to, to be there to, to make sure I don't take it to heart. He got a red card against Brentford, so he'll be on the bench. So he'll be in the stands. So Jose uh, Pochettino has got it all coming his way, and rightfully so. But the thing that gets to me about this is people have got to remember, we didn't even – I didn't want him. I did not want him at the club. made it very vocal. We didn't even make a move for him. You know, if we had come in for him and Chelsea had gone in for him and he would chose Chelsea, then huge amount of daggers. He's – we didn't go in for him, whatever. He still shouldn't have gone there. He, he has crossed the line. He had blatantly crossed the line. But everyone was singing for him. We're going, oh, we love Pochettino. We want him. Oh, we want him. We want him. He's magic. He's magic. And now he's gone over there all of a sudden. Oh, by the by, the, the most important thing for this, for me, this is the hottest ticket of the... Anyone who's got a season ticket, I will always say the North London derby is the be or end all at White Hart Lane. This season is this game. Because of everything that gets chucked in with it, what the the players? I mean, the fans. I think this is going to be the best. Re- this season, that stadium has been electric. I think this this game coming is going to be bigger than the the three nil against the filth with Conte. But atmosphere. This is the game. The players have got to make sure they don't take that and think right. This is out like a battle of the bridge. This is right. We're top of the league. This is another game. We've got to go out and do our thing. And if destiny's there, then I, I, destiny being there is so important, is vital, absolutely pivotal for me for that game. I, th- if you look at it, I don't think there's a, an area in the pitch right now that they're stronger than us. Not a single, like as a unit, they may have a player who's outperforming, whatever. But right now, our defence is better than theirs, and our defence is better than their attack. Just everything. We are better at right now. And there's no getting at the facts. The stats don't lie. The performances, the results. If Tottenham go in, as in the players go, right, this is just another game. Yes, it's a big one. It's the West. It's the Spurs Chelsea derby. And they play like they've been playing. I have got no doubt in my mind this is a Spurs victory. Maybe not as comfortable as Adrian thinks with a 4 1. I'd love it. I'd absolutely love it. But I think if Tottenham turn up and do what they've been doing, there's only one result, and it's the Spurs win. 
Oh, mm. I can't wait at home as what well. What is going on with amazing. you? I know. It's a madness. I'm loving it. It's so much better than the therapy sessions last season. Um, I love all oh. the positive talk. Uh, hopefully that we do manage to get the business done. Uh, again, there'll be no Holly Sotswes live because it is a Monday night fixture. So I might look to do a watch along. We'll see how that one goes. Um, but like I said, it's amazing to chat to all three of you tonight uh, to dissect the Palace game. So we'll go around in a circle and we'll do our little goodbyes and where we can find us all. So first of all, Luke, thank you very much for coming on the show again. Where can everybody find you? Uh, thank you, Holly. It's uh, you know really appreciated to come back on once again. Um, yeah, you can find me at Park Lane Podcast. Uh, we're live every Sunday night, 7pm on YouTube. Um, and so, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in what I've had to say, come over and check it out. Um, but also, you know, when you do that, make sure you go around all these guys in the in the panel as well, especially yourself, Holly, and uh, liking, subscribing. You know, if you like any Spurs podcast, go check out the ball because, uh, you know, we all love the same team, right? We should all support each other. Agreed, 100%. And I think the thing is as well, where it's not a therapy session this season, it's also very nice to get involved with everything and in the chats and stuff because it's such a positive place to be at the moment. But thank you again, Luke. And Harry as well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can everybody find you doing your thing? Yeah, thank you for having me on, Holly. If you want to follow me, you can at Harry Scarf. Uh, 22 uh, on Twitter, for example, TikTok, the, all the socials. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can. Scarfie's first talk uh, every Monday. Uh, you know the usual um, you know, episodes, the podcasts. Uh, yeah, like you say, it's nice for it not to be a therapy session. There'll be there will be none on Monday the sixth because obviously Tottenham play Chelsea. I'm, I'm going. Um, so yeah, I'm really that, delighted for that. But there will be one once I've finished your here. So if you want to go and tune in, and also co- one of four co-hosts, obviously the best one, but one of four co-hosts, uh, a part in podcast every Sunday, 7 p.m., which is great. I mean, you may not have to want to listen to what Luke has to say, but at least I'm on it. So you can tune in. <laughs> Jeez, the smoke. Oh my days. But no, uh, thank you, Harry. <laughs> Harry, were you a good fit through that door? <laughs> 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 oh my days but no thank you harry for coming on and brian thank you, thank you again so much uh for coming on where can everybody find you doing your thing as well first of all holly it's always an absolute pleasure to spend time with you and be on your show all three of these guys they'll do that right three now i've got this there you go <laughs> those three are are fantastic like and subscribe to to all the great work they do uh Tottenham on tour what's coming up there, there there's loads of stuff coming up uh normally daily content um but I will say, just December, Tottenham and Tour have got a few shows going on. They're going to be a lot of fun and very, very Christmassy with a few surprises. It's going to be very, very good viewing. So we're doing a lot of work right now towards our Christmas uh, uh, stuff. So, uh, yeah, and all I will say about the channel is we have officially launched our own merchandise. Ooh. There are T-shirts available, Tottenham on Tour, Mickey Van Defend. Um <laughs> So it's on www.tottenhamontour.com. So if you want any T-shirts or caps, men and women, multiple colours, go check that out. But most importantly, follow and subscribe to all three of these people. Yeah. Legend. Thank you. Cheers, Brian. And like I say, thank you to everybody that's tuning in. That's going to be tuning in later to, to watch this on uh, the rewatch. Um, I do really appreciate it. Make sure you go check everybody out. Um, like I said, uh, there might be a show Wednesday. It might just be Wes. Uh, hosting this week's uh, fan show. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. And until next time, come on, you Spurs. <laughs>